meeting God in change. Now, uh, I've uh, journeyed through life and uh, I think I am more competent to speak on change than many of you because of my age and the experiences I have gone through. Change is inevitable. The Bible says from glory to glory is changing me. Right? And often in life, the people who become more successful are those who are more open to change than others. There is a famous hymn which says, Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but I will never. Glory to his name. Have you heard that one? It's sung here sometimes by some of us. And whenever you look at a portion of scripture and you see somebody go beyond and accomplish something in terms of God's will, God's purpose, and God's plan, almost always it was their ability to be God in change. You know, it's interesting. I noticed uh, two people who normally sit in this row sit on that row this Sunday. <laughs> and for me, that's exciting. <laughs> Because it means they're open to change. Change is inevitable. So some of you who are here, next Sunday come and sit there, so I get confused. I can mentally work out in three minutes who is not in church today. Just by looking across from one side to the other. Because people almost always sit in the same place on Sunday. Change is inevitable. Number two, it is your decisions and not your condition that determine your destiny. And I want to talk to you from the life of Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 5. And the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your kindred, your father's house to a land that I will show you. Abraham is not as young as he would have liked to be and life has moved on and yet Abraham is called the friend of God because of his willingness to navigate the change that God was ready to bring into his life. You know many 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 years ago when people first migrated in the 80s they stayed in one part of this city and they didn't want to move because they were comfortable then. Change is challenging. And the older we get, the more difficult it is to change. It's like the lady who said, I cut my hand the way my mom cuts her hand, the way her mom and my grandpa cut the hand. Go and get a hand cutting machine. It's easier. <laughs> Change is challenging. But unless you are open to change that God orchestrates, you will never fulfill the ultimate destiny and purpose that God has for your life. Everything in the world is changing. You know, the day of the old typewriter is over. Because you can't buy ribbons for that anymore. And some of us, we are stuck in a place not because God doesn't want to do something more in us and through us, but because we are desensitized to the change that God wants to bring into our lives. Because we come to point two, change is painful. 
We like life to work in a predictable manner. Some of you do prayer time in the morning, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, on the night. And when you don't meet that commitment, you feel guilty. But God has no God. God does not always work in a predictable manner. Somebody is resistant to change. Wow, he is not going out without a shout. <laughs> change is painful. Third thing is that change is personal. We can never change the world we live in unless and until like Abraham, we are open to the change that God wants to do in our lives. Truth doesn't change. God doesn't change. The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. And often we settle for a less than life because change is fearful and unpredictable because even on the best of days and the most spiritual we are, we still want to be in control. When God brings change, life gets out of control. But if we truly trust God, then we can allow Him to direct our lives and flow in the changes. God entered Abraham's world to give him a new sense of purpose and direction. And God said, go from your country, your kindred, your father's house, <clears throat> clean break to a land I will show you. So change is progressive. And if you only follow my direction, I will bless those that bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in all the families of the earth, you shall be blessed. And so Abraham goes. But Lot went with him. God said, Abraham, you go. But he took Lot along. And before long, that became a tension in Abraham's life. Last night I was just meditating on this whole principle and this is what I got out of the scripture. Only you know what is important in your life. Only you know the God-given vision that he has placed in your heart. And you have to be careful that you don't share your dream and vision with the wrong people. Lot wasn't a, a bad guy. But when you look at his life and the decisions he made, there is evidence, evidence that he lived a spiritually smaller life. So you want to be careful whom you allow into your life. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 10 it says, Do not yoke an ox and an ass together. And when God says that he is not talking about Jewish dietary laws, he's talking about a simple principle about the yoke. Because the two animals had different strengths and different limitations. So for, my, for me and my life, I am careful whom I yoke with. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed. When I enter into a relationship, 
I want to make sure that the person I enter into the relationship with is walking in the same direction of purpose that God has for my life. Here's another principle. Abraham must have fed Lot with the God-given vision. But because Lot lived with a different set of rules, he couldn't receive the revelation. <coughs> Stop wasting time with the wrong people, hoping they will change. They won't. <coughs> Cut loose and move on. That's the principle that you and I have to learn to live by. <coughs> if you don't, you will end up living a less than life. God wants to redirect our life spiritually. But in order to do that, we must be open to the changes he wants to bring in. Because <coughs> Abraham, Abraham is called the friend of God. The destiny of the Jewish people was placed in one man's hand and his willingness to move in the direction that God has it. But it's interesting because when you look at Genesis chapter 11 verse 31 and 32, Abraham leaves the earth and settles in Cain, in, in Haran. Wow. That's not the place that God wanted him to be. And it's uh, another interesting truth that his father's name was Terah, which means station, stopping place, delay. And so rather than go to the destiny and purpose that God had for him, he stopped halfway. And only after his father's death did he move on. So there are principles in scripture by which God wants us to live by. If God has revealed a purpose for your life, pursue that purpose and give yourself to it. I studied some research yesterday about a hundred people who believe they have a destiny. Only five percent in where they want to be. Five percent. Because they are unwilling to push through the struggle, the challenges, and they give up just before they finish. They say in Bible colleges in the USA, 25% of students quit before the final exam. So I want to ask you the question this morning as I ask the question of myself. Where are you in the journey of life? Are you in the halfway mark? Paul says, forgetting the things that are behind, I press forward. God presented Abraham with a promise. But he also said, there is a process. And number three is a life choice. So it's great to receive a promise from God. But every promise has a condition of obedience attached to it. Every promise of God. Whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Whosoever comes to me. So there are some things that God will do for us and there are some things we got to do for ourselves. He won't do it for us. The ox and a donkey don't team up. So if you are an ox, don't team up with a donkey. You'll end up in the wrong place. It's a principle. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's the New Testament. So there's a yoking. You've got to align your life with people who are going Godward. 
Doesn't mean you give up your unchanged friends. No, 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 no. Friendship has different levels. But if you want to fulfill the God-given destiny for your life, then you've got to decide whom do I yoke with? I have opportunities to go to many places in the world and preach, but I don't. Because there is no equal yoking. I work out of relationship that has been built and established over a long period of time. Because there is trust built. Number two, you don't open your life to somebody you just met. There is a Chinese, uh, the, 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 the Chinese people, they take a long time to build trust. In Singapore, you can get half a million dollars on loan without an IOU because of trust. God wants to redirect us. But we got to be careful that you don't end up in the wrong place because you yoked with the wrong people. The call came to Abraham, to thee, but they went out. And as a consequence of an unequal yoking, there was a tension in Lot and Abraham's life. And in Genesis 13, it was only after Abraham had this disconnected from Lot did God speak to him again. I don't know who God is speaking to this morning. But I want to ask you a question. Who impacts your life? Whose voice do you listen to? And now you know we need to understand that, that Abraham was a sort of oriental culture and, and you know, you know I feel alone. When God speaks to us, he often does it alone. When we are by ourselves. But sometimes because of our anxiety and fear, we want to take somebody along. And then, somewhere down the road, there's going to be a tension and a conflict. My life experience has taught me that. When you are successful, there are others who want to hitch to your wagon and you have to pull them along. That's not God's will. So you've got to be careful whom you yoke with. You know, young people, there are some young people not here or in there who missionary date. You know what missionary dating is? I meet a guy or a girl and they are not exactly a believer but they are better than the believers and I agree. And they are praying and hoping that the person they are dating might have a spiritual turn. But the Bible is already clear. Do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Because there's going to be at some point a tension in life. Better to cry now than cry for the rest of your life. Amen. At least my wife says amen. So amen. I'm serious. I'm serious. So the blessing of change came to Abraham when he chose to obey. You and I have the power with God's help to change the trajectory of our lives if you open to it. Abraham is called the friend of God because of his willingness to change when God spoke to him. And there are a lot of good people who are close to change. They resist change. 
because they have grown up in a culture and an environment where change wasn't part of their lives. And so when they grow up and become adults, they find it hard to change. I'll pray about it. Abraham, Abraham didn't pray about it. He moved because he heard the voice of God. When God says move, you have to move. And the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years. They had to move. When the cloud moved, they had to move. If not, they would have been left behind. God didn't tell the Israelites, hey, I'm going to move. Are you ready? No. He just moved. And so they had to pack their tents and move. God moves when we are in motion. And the more you will accomplish in life will often be the more willing you are to change. Embrace change because change is always progressing. It is. Every time God did something, He said, Behold, I will do a new thing. And we love that verse. And we quote and misquote that verse from time to time. In order to end the new thing, you've got to leave the old thing behind. You can't have the old thing and experience the new at the same time. Jesus spoke about this truth. The new wine can't be contained in an old wine skin. So we're going to be open to change. Color your hair purple next Sunday. That's change. I might come with a toupee, orange. That's my favorite color at the moment. Some of you know why. Change is inevitable. And your ability to adjust to the God orchestrated changes will take you faster to your destiny. So don't stop like Abraham did at Aaron and get in the way of the will, purpose and plan of God. Change is uncomfortable. If I had my way, I would have moved 10 houses by now. I only need three. I'm open to change. Anytime. I have a sensitivity to the Spirit's direction. And sometimes I move in a direction where I really can't understand why I am going in that way. But when I go there, I realize why. I'm not afraid of change. Sometimes I change so fast that others can't keep up with me. But that's why I'm successful. I don't apologize for Humility is not a gift of mine. Some of you know that. God sees the heart. I, I, I like people to say, but you know, Pastor, God sees your heart. Yeah, you see the other part. <laughs> you know, it takes a lot to be humble. Oh, God, I can tell you a few stories on that. So be open to change. God doesn't work. When all the ducks line up, in a predictable way. We're going to look at another guy who was open to change. In the book of Acts chapter 8. Philip the evangelist. There was persecution on the church. Persecution by the way is healthy for the church. It's healthy. Because when the church gets persecuted, people rise up. Wow. Is that the only, that seems to be the only way in the New Testament. So Paul is, he is, he is, you know, taking Christians and putting them into prison. And then in the midst of all this Jewish context, there's Philip the Evangelist, by the way. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them Christ. Wow. The number one 
priority for the existence of a church is to preach the gospel of God's love to lost and sinful people. That's the only reason we exist. Everything else is a command. So, Philip is not essentially Jewish. He's not one of the twelve. This is Philip the Evangelist. And, and you know something? Evangelists are open to the direction of the Holy Spirit. They have a heart and passion to see lost people come into the kingdom. So Philip, the evangelist, goes to Samaria. Now you need to understand the cultural conflict here. The Jewish people thought they were better than the Samaritans. Prejudice, racial prejudice, is an anthropological fact. But Philip, he has no bias, he has no racial prejudice against the Samaritans who were less than in the eyes of the Jewish people and he goes there and he preaches the gospel to them and they get saved. Wow! The eleven disciples, apostles who were in Jerusalem didn't know it because they had prejudice. And your prejudice can become an obstacle to the progress of the church. Somebody said this Sunday is the most segregated day in the United States of America. Shouldn't be so. God created the universe in colors. And God has no prejudice against people who are different to us. Neither should we. Neither should we. So Philip had to be used by God to go to this Samaritan group because their hearts were open. Philip understood the need to change his paradigms of how to do church the way God wanted it done. It's not the way we want to do church. We don't get to vote on this. God does. Because it's his church, he died for it, he has ownership for it. Amen? It is, it's, it's very interesting, Ephesians chapter 3, 1 to 6, don't turn to it. The Jews thought the Samaritans were a less than people group. The, the Gentiles were a less than people group. But Paul says they are members of the same body, partakers of the promise through the gospel. Wow. God was shifting the racial, social, cultural boundaries of the church and the church had to embrace the change. Otherwise they would be left behind. That's the challenge of today. The challenge of today for the New Testament church is the willingness to embrace people God embraces. Because God looks at people in a different way to the way you look at them. That's the challenge. God didn't come to die for the Sri Lanka church. No. He came to die for the Ross church. Amen. That's what he came for. Reread your Bible. God's view of his kingdom isn't narrow and confined to any one culture. And often what keeps the church from growing is not God, but our own unwillingness as believers to embrace and accept people who are different to us. It gets better. Now Philip is leading a revival. And then in the book of Acts, once again, chapter 8, 26 to 39, 
the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. From I plant a churches in two countries. Okay, so I know what I'm talking about. Let me tell you something. They won't come to us. We have to go to them. That's the principle. That's the principle. Jesus walked 40 miles and went to one village for one woman who touched her community. <coughs> you and I have a responsibility biblically to take the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his grace manifest in our lives and share it with those who don't know. It's not difficult. It's not difficult. It's very easy. If your heart is tuned to God and you're willing to live selflessly, not selfishly, that's the difference. Selflessly. You know, in, in Western Christianity, it's culture of what's in it for me. What's in it for me? I come to be blessed. That's great. But take the portion of your blessing and give it to somebody who is less blessed than you. That's what Philip did. So now you think, he's in the midst of a revival. You know, I'll, I'll repeat this story. I, I uh, one day asked somebody, he was coming to church, she was coming to church, we don't know which gender. I said, can you go and pick up somebody? And you know what I told him? I'm going to church. And I said, isn't that what church is for? I thought, oh my God. God must love me to keep me here for 73 years. We don't know why we do church sometimes. Because we bring all these traditional concepts of church with us, out of the baggage. Philip is leading a revival. And you will think from God's perspective that's the most important thing in God's eyes. No. No. Revival is God's, not Philip's enemy. Ownership is his. And what's the Philip? Go down, arise and go towards the south. To the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. There's a desert there. Google, Gaza desert, it's then technical. And here was happened, now no, he doesn't know why he's going. He goes. And there was an Ethiopian. This is the first African convert to the, 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 the Christian faith outside Judaism. Wow. He's reading his scrolls and he's trying to understand the book of Isaiah. And the Spirit of God says, Philip, verse 29, join to the chariot. So he ran to him. Hello, my friend, you can pray, God send somebody to me. No, 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 no. You pray, send somebody to me, you go out and do it. That's the harder part. And he ran to him and heard him reading. I said, the prophet. And then Philip explains the scripture to him. Wow. And he accepts faith in Christ. I try to understand why did God use Philip and not the eleven apostles? The most important group of leadership in that church were the apostles. But they had prejudice. They had prejudice. And God had to deal with it in a vision to Peter. Wow. So God used somebody else. Because he was open to the change. And God wants to use you like he used Philip. We are called to build bridges to lost people, not drive bridges. Three results of Philip's attitude to change. Number one, there was conversion. Number two, there was joy. And number three, the church went beyond Gentile converts to become uh, the first African came to the faith.
just because of one man's openness to change. There is a certain person in this congregation who came to Christ sitting in a study in my room and he is taking what he received and sharing it across the nation of Sri Lanka and many, many people are coming to Christ. Because he's open. Often we aren't. God has placed a deposit of truth in your, of your life. What are you doing with it? You are nurturing our faith. No, no, God does not want us to nurture our faith. He wants to take our faith and share it with us. When I committed my life to Christ, I didn't know where the book of Revelation was, but I shared my faith. And I continue to do so. I should be more, uh, at this point in my life, thinking which, uh, which coffin I'm going to be buried in. Costco is cheap, by the way. That was a special one. I wanted to pay in advance because I'm going. Last week I was driving down uh, Heatherton Road and in front of me was a hearse and I thought, wow, before long I'm going to be in that one. That's exciting. So you know what I'm doing? I decided to live my life to make every day count. I'm not going to talk about church. Doing church, I'm going to do church. The Jesus way. The way he wants it. That's all. That's all. And you know what? When you make that life choice, God will bring people to you. And you will have to go to people whose hearts God has prepared. This eunuch, and my view is a eunuch, And he had the honor and privilege of not only leading that guy to Christ, but baptizing him in some water that was there. You don't normally find water in the desert. No three baptism classes immediately. And back again. And he goes to Amar present praise the Lord. Now, the proclamation of the good news is not limited to evangelists. You are the evangelist. And you can do it because you have a story. It might be a good story, it might be a bad story, it might be an ugly story, it's still a story. You have a story. Do you believe that? You do. We all do. We all have a story. Some of us, God has come through the way we wanted him to. That's a story. Some of us, you're still waiting for your miracle. That's a story because it's only the grace of God that keeps you where you are. That's a story. Ecclesiastes 3.11, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Last Friday night, I asked a young person from, from this church to to share her story and I really didn't know what had been happening but I just gave her that text and I understand that the story she shared was a blessing to many who came. That's a story. You are going through pain. That's a story. I am going to remain faithful to God because I trust God to come through. You know when they were, when they were singing the goodness of God, I, my mind went back to uh, 2015 and my bypass the operation sit, sitting there in, in the in the uh, what do you call that uh, rehab uh, rehabilitation you know at about 11 o'clock in the night I can't move this way I can't move that way because I fall off the bed and that could be another problem and I was weeping I had what's called a catharsis I was weeping uncontrollably I think I rang my daughter at 11 o'clock at night and uh, you know, uh, uh, just felt that I can talk to her. I was just sobbing. And then there was a knock. And the nurse walked in and said, Are you a Christian? I said, Yes. Because she heard the worship tape. 10,000 reasons to sing. I did have 10,000 reasons. 
I can assure you. But she said, I'm a believer. God wanted me to sit, uh, God wanted me to come and just tell you, it's going to be all right. Wow. And for me, that was the story. So sometimes, sometimes, you might think I only have a story when everything works out for me. Not true. You may be going through something unique to you at this time, but the grace of God is on your life, and that is a story. That is a story. So I want to encourage you this morning. Wherever you are in the journey of life, don't stop halfway. Don't stop at Aaron. Disconnect from Lot. If you have Lot in your life, because if you yoke with the wrong people, they are going to take you in the opposite direction of the purpose and plan of God. Shall we? God is the starting point for every life journey. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. And this morning, if you have not committed your life to Christ, that is the starting point. Say, I'm like Abraham. I'm a, I, uh, Abraham was an idol worshiper, but God redeemed himself. <laughs> and Abraham responded, you just put your hand up and put it on a grave. I won't call you forward. You just want to say, Lord Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you. Just put your hand up and put it down, pray a simple prayer with you. Anyone here? Yes, just put it down. Thank you. Just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. This morning, I commit my life to you. Like Abraham, you are opening a window of opportunity for me to enter into my destiny and purpose. It's never too late to start. Lord, like Abraham, I'm making a life choice today to follow you. Give me the grace, give me the tenacity to hold on to the dream that you are placing in my heart. Because you will come through and bless me as you have done. Now, Father, we pray this morning for others that they will open their hearts to share their story of your grace in their lives. Lord, you want to raise up Philips. Lord, you want to send us to hearts that are open. And I pray that you will give us a sensitivity to people who need to know you so that we might become the catalyst for change in their lives to the willingness that we are open to your change. Lord, continue to speak to us as a church and take us forward in the destiny and purpose for which you have brought us into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you and God bless you.